Welcome to Live from the Vatican, the canonization edition. I'm Raymond Arroyo, wishing a warm welcome to all of you joining us around the world. During the next 30 minutes, we'll examine the lives and legacies of Saints John Paul and John the 23rd. I will once again be joined by the canonization crew, Robert Royal, Father Gerald Murray, and Father Robert Barron. They'll be here a little later, as well as CNBC senior contributor Larry Kudlow. But first, I'd like to welcome a very special guest. He's a Curiel official, the former Archbishop of St. Louis, and the current head of the Apostolic Signatura here in Rome, Raymond Cardinal Burke, your eminence. Thank you for being welcome, here. Welcome, Raymond. Good Great to, to see you. you. I want to start with John Paul II. Yeah. He raised you to become a bishop yes. uh, of St. Louis, before that in uh, Wisconsin, yes. in La Crosse. What, in what way did he shape your ministry, and what is your, the most important memory you have of him? I would say that the most important memory was his attention to the priesthood and to the theology of the priesthood, which had suffered so severely in the years after the council, this kind of confusion about the, the royal priesthood of the baptized and the ordained priesthood. And he began almost immediately writing letters to priests every Holy Thursday, and then uh, he wrote the beautiful apostolic exhortation, Pastores Dabo Vobis, and uh, mm -hmm. throughout his, his entire pontificate, he uh, taught us how to be good priests, uh, not only by, by his remarkable magisterium, but also by his example. Mm. Tell me about, and you deal with this every day, uh, in, in your current capacity as the uh, head of the Supreme Court of the Vatican, I guess is the shorthand, yes. the apostolic signature. He updated the code of canon law. He also gave us the catechism. Could you put both of those rather important, though administrative uh, uh, events, in some perspective? Why do you think he went to such efforts? Well, it's interesting because it was it's assumed to be St. John the Twenty-Third who announced the, the revision of the Code of Canon Law together with the announcement of the Council and the Synod for the Diocese of Rome. And that work, of course, had to wait to, for the council to finish, but then there was this long period after the council and still the revision didn't come. And uh, an unfortunate thing happened was some people began to think, well, there wasn't any more any canon law and the kind of euphoria after the council, you know, the, the era of love and freedom. And so uh, it was uh, John Paul II who with determination uh, from the beginning of his pontificate insisted that this revision be completed. And in 1983, he was able to promulgate the code. And then, uh, not too long thereafter, uh, to mandate the catechism of the Catholic Church, I would put it rather simply, and it's this, that uh, obviously the, the, the height of our life in the Church is the encounter with Christ, the personal relationship mm -hmm. with Christ. But in order to, to know Christ, and in order to, to be disposed to encounter Him, we need discipline, which comes through the church's laws and uh, through the moral law above all, but also the particular laws, for instance, which govern the sacred liturgy or Catholic education, the various aspects of our lives. Mm -hmm. And of course, we need sound doctrine. Otherwise, we have strange things like people right. who claim that they believe in Jesus Christ, but they don't believe that he's God the Son uh, incarnate, God, mm -hmm. God made man. And so uh, I think that John Paul II uh, soon to be St. John Paul II, uh, gave us a really a remarkable gift that we're still drawing upon and we will be for decades yeah. uh, in the Catechism of the Catholic Church and the Court of Canon Law. Well, as, as, I, as I thought about this, form is so important, form as well as substance. Yes. And it seems these two moments, the updating of the code and the catechism, was part of making sure that that form was in place so that people could have that encounter. That's what it really is about, it's yes. serving that that's, moment. That's correct, because where you, when you don't have the, the form, when you don't have the, the good order, uh, then the encounter with Christ is blocked. It's blocked by our own selfishness. It's by, blocked by confusion. And of course, we must never forget that Satan is always at work sowing the seeds of confusion and error. And uh, it is our, our our doctrine and our and our discipline that helps us to be strong in in fighting those kind of temptations. Yeah. And, and John Paul had that beautiful way of balancing both an engaging, welcoming approach with doctrinal. Uh, uh, solidity and surety. That's right. And he made sure that he kept those in a beautiful balance. In what way did he inspire you? What do you recall of that, not only his witness, but personally, because you encountered him so many times? My most <laughs> outstanding or extraordinary encounter with him was, of course, at the time that he ordained me a bishop mm -hmm. on uh, January 6th of 1995. And I, I saw in that moment the 
the complete investment of the man in, in, in the giving himself to the church or in any of these new bishops and in the homily for instance directing a personal word to each bishop about uh, mm -hmm. his challenges as a shepherd of the flock mm -hmm. and we had then as our example uh, the the bishop of the universal church uh, john paul ii himself to to use our best efforts to communicate the truth of the faith but always to hold to that truth not to be communicating ourselves but to be communicating Jesus Christ. Right. And that was uh, uh, his whole message of new evangelization. Uh -huh. I want to talk for a moment. We, the last time we spoke, we talked about this global debate, conversation, dialogue, I suppose, that the cardinals are having about how do you deal with divorced and remarried Catholics. Mm -hmm. um, you have been very outspoken. Cardinal O'Malley has been very outspoken, as has Cardinal Casper on, I would imagine, the other side of this debate. Uh, there was a phone call the Pope made to a woman in Argentina that has been getting an enormous amount of media play where he is alleged to have said to her, and we have to put that in quotation marks, uh, tell her she's divorced and remarried, and she sa he said, you may go to communion. What impression is that sending, and are you concerned that this may tip this debate one way or the other? Well, I I can't imagine, except in the most superficial of all worlds, that it would tip the debate. A report in the, in the media of a phone conversation, and that report, as far as I know, is based solely on the word of the woman or her husband. Mm -hmm. And uh, until the, the, the one who spoke the word tells us uh, what he said and what he intended, I, I'm not in a position to, yeah. to, to surmise. But uh, if we let things like this, these kind of stories, uh, uh, d distract us from teaching the truth about marriage and, and seeing how that truth can be more effectively communicated to young people so that they be prepared for our marriage and it, it, as God created marriage from the beginning as our Lord Jesus himself referred if, if, from the beginning he made the man and woman for an indissoluble, indissoluble faithful and, and procreative union and so uh, I, uh, yes, it's causing a lot of consternation. A lot of people are very disturbed, but we, we have to keep ourselves on solid ground and say, well, until the Pope himself says uh, mm -hmm. what he intended, we're just based on a story. Yeah. And even the Vatican spokesman the other day said, this is not how we teach magisterially no. via a no, phone no, call. No, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Even, even, you know, and, and whether I can't, it's legitimate I can't, or not. No, and I can't, I wouldn't for the a moment impute to Pope Francis that he intended to give a signal about church doctrine by calling someone on the phone. I mean, this is just <laughs> absurd. You are going to be in this square behind us yes. tomorrow at this very important moment. What are you most looking forward to? Well, I, the Eucharist itself, which is the, uh, for both pontiffs and, and in a particular way for Pope John Paul II, whom I knew so, much, so well, is the heart of our Catholic faith. And to have these two figures who were so uh, so central to the work of the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council, the, yeah. the presence of the church in the world today. There is no more uh, uh, perfect and, and no more effective presence than the offering of the, of the Holy Mass, and that to me will be the, mm -hmm. the, the height of the celebration. Well, we are going to be so looking forward to Good. seeing you, Pope Benedict, Pope Francis, <laughs> all together, and of course, this great occasion. Your Eminence, thank you for being here. You're most here. welcome, Raymond. Thank God you. bless you. Thank you. When we return, CNBC senior contributor, radio host, and convert to Catholicism, Larry Kudlow is here to talk about St. John Paul II's teaching on the economy and much more. Live from the Vatican returns in a moment. Welcome back to Live from the Vatican. I'm Raymond Arroyo. We're unpacking the life and legacy of the Catholic Church's latest saints, Pope John Paul the Great and Pope John the 23rd. Joining me now to offer his thoughts, particularly on John Paul's economic teaching, I'm joined by CNBC senior contributor and syndicated columnist, Larry Kudlow. Thank you, nice Thank to you. Thank you for Appreciate being here, Larry. Much. Let's talk, you are a convert to the faith. Yes. What impact did John Paul have, if any, uh, on yeah, your journey? It, considerable. And, um, one of the important things uh, that struck me, he, his idea, be not afraid, 
That was a key phrase, a catchphrase for him. <laughs> and I love that. I mean, be not afraid is, is a way to live life. But I, the way I always saw it is be not afraid to do the right thing, think the right thing, behave the right way, be moral, be religious, mm -hmm. you know, be family, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. And don't go with the flow of this awful turn towards secularization that we are witnessing. Yeah, yeah. And you really turned your life around. I, I know, did. I, I know did. Father C. John McCloskey was part of that journey, and it's it's interesting to see you now. Well, I've said, you know, I've said before that the first time I went to mass, and my life was uh, crashing and burning. I mean, mm -hmm. I was just a a hopeless uh, abuser of alcohol and drugs, and everything was going wrong. But the first time I went to Mass, Sim Johnson in New York City oh. took me to Mass, distinguished uh, author. And I loved the Mass. I, lo really? I loved the order. I loved the form. The, the form. I loved the rituals. I loved the water. I loved the smoke. <laughs> I loved the incense. I loved everything about it. Now, I, I, it took me several, many years to convert after that. Yeah. But I just fell in love with you it. You were drawn to the beauty. I was. And hmm. as a guy who needed order in his life hmm. and who needed a moral compass, that was a good thing. I want to share something with you. This is a piece of John Paul's landmark teaching, Sentient. This was the 1991 encyclical, and he writes, It would appear that on the level of individual nations and of international relations, the free market is the most efficient instrument for utilizing resources and effectively responding to needs. But this is true only for those needs which are solvent insofar as they are endowed with purchasing power and for those resources which are marketable insofar as they are capable of obtaining a satisfactory price but there are many human needs which find no place in the market it is a strict duty of justice and truth not to allow fundamental human needs to remain mm -hmm. unsatisfied and not to allow those burdened by mm -hmm. such needs mm -hmm. to perish your mm -hmm. thoughts on that does that sound like it's in any way hemming in or caging in the free market? Well, actually, I think he had it right both ways. Mm -hmm. I, I think the, the lines about the free market are correct. He acknowledged mm -hmm. it's the most efficient resource. Mm -hmm. um, but he also, I, the way I read that, yeah. there are other things in life. There are other things in life. And, mm -hmm. and I think he's absolutely right about mm -hmm. that. So we have to live the moral life. We have to live the good life. We have to live the religious mm -hmm. life. Um, but yes, he came, probably more than any pope, he came closest. Yeah. To, the, to the free market uh, model. And I, as I understand the story, is yeah. that he did not begin that way, but mm -hmm. it was Lech Walesa who helped turn him around mm -hmm. because when Walesa became president of Poland and they tried some mixture of socialism and what was left of mm -hmm. communism, and none of it worked. And, and Walesa and his uh, finance ministers they went. They were the first big bang towards a market oh, economy, right. yeah. and after a couple of years, it worked so well that Pope John Paul II, John I think, had huge influence on mm. him. It's almost the reverse. Today, Pope Francis, unfortunately, has the Argentine experience oh. to draw from uh, in terms yeah. of the economy, and the Argentine experience is a catastrophe, mm. and it is a a kind of combination of corporatism, socialism, cronyism, cronyism. cronyism. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and that's really the old-time definition of fascism is basically it's within the private market mm -hmm. but the government directs all the resources and hands that you right. get this you get that right. and I think um, you know with with all God knows with all due respect and love I think um, Pope Francis needs a little more balance in the way he describes this economy and the way he sees the economic yeah. world. I think their ends are the same because he's pointing to the human needs and saying, look, this, the, the economy, all of this exists to serve the human person, mm -hmm. but how you get there is the, is the interesting well, thing. Well, I, do, I don't think, you know, I, I don't think the most important thing for a pope is the economy. Economic theory. I just don't yeah. think it is. And yeah. I, I don't expect the Catholic Church to subscribe to the Wealth of Nations by Adam <laughs> Smith or to my yeah. idol Friedrich Hayek or yeah. anything yeah. like that. I, I don't believe that. Yeah. I, I think the battle here, again, is to do good, live good. Mm -hmm. And I think the, 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 the huge battle, we have it in the United States, you have it in Europe, is the secularization battle, all right? Mm -hmm. And let us not forget Pope Benedict, because although he was only in a short time, that was his major effort to yep. try to fight the secularization of Europe, for example. Mm -hmm. We're seeing the same thing in the United States. And 
I, th I think that's wrong. I think it has no values. Mm -hmm. I think there's no standards. Uh, living life is a moving target. Mm -hmm. I, I, look, I can tell you, it did work for me. No, it doesn't and work I, for And anybody. I'm happy to give personal witness to it. And, mm -hmm. and I think people have got to have got to think about how they live, and I think that's going to be Pope Francis's very biggest Final question in our last minute. What do you hope to take away from this moment of watching two popes raised to the altar in the presence of two popes tomorrow? Well, I, I, I think the splendor is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And again, as a convert, it's a remarkable thing that in my lifetime such a thing happened. I doubt it's going to happen for a long time, oh. okay? That's just my guess. Yep. The splendor of it, the, the magisterial realm of it, and the meanings behind it, the meanings behind it. Yeah. This is such a beautiful magisterial moment, but it is also a very serious moment of intent and of proselytizing and of sending a message. That's the key. I agree. Larry Kudlow. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Appreciate Pleasure it. to be with you. When we return, the canonization crew is back. Father Robert Barron, Robert Royal, and Father Jerry Murray will preview the big event tomorrow's historic double canonizations. More live from the Vatican in a moment. Stay right there. Welcome back to Live from the Vatican. I'm Raymond Arroyo, joined again by our canonization crew, Robert Royal, editor-in-chief of The Catholic Thing, Father Jerry Murray of the Archdiocese of New York, and Father Robert Barron of Word on Fire Ministries and rector of Mundelein Seminary. Thank you all for being here. I want to put both of these popes into some context, particularly their international engagement. Now, we know John the 23rd famously got on a train. He was one of the first popes to leave Rome. He went up to Assisi. John Paul goes to 129 countries. So it, I feel embarrassed kind of raising it that way. But they, but the fact is, they, he did break ground in his time, John the 23rd, and it was a major move for a pope. Absolutely. I think both are missionary popes. As you say, it was just the breaking of the ground with John the 23rd, and then John Paul II takes up that banner and becomes the most extraordinary missionary, arguably, in the whole history of the church. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that was made possible by the moves that John the 23rd made and the attitude that he exemplified. Mm. Uh, Robert Royal, I want you to talk a bit. We were speaking about this the other day, that important 1979 trip to Poland, the Pope's first, John Paul II, St. John Paul's. Uh, it, it created the space there for the faith to revive and for that solidarity movement that was already in place to really catch fire. Talk about that and the way in which he did it. Well, I think the one, the, the, you have to back up a little bit before that because it's really the way that he internalized Vatican II in his archdiocese of Krakow, mm -hmm. where there really was a very faithful application of Vatican II. So his people were prepared in his own archdiocese. Mm -hmm. But that was a very explosive situation, as many of us remember, that um, here you've got the first Polish pope uh, ever, and he comes in as this great charismatic figure, and it could have very easily descended, as many people have said, into violence. Yep. revolution. He wanted to keep the lid on, but at the same time he wanted to encourage them. He wanted them to know that they could come to God, that they could be free, that, that they, they were, uh, because they are human persons made in God's image and likeness, that they had a certain dignity over and against whatever the communist regime yeah. said. So he walked a very fine line there, but he kept that whole thing yeah. alive at that moment. Father Jerry, you, Robert, you and myself were at this dinner last night with President Lech Walesa. It was uh, hosted by Newsmax TV. And uh, it was spectacular listening to his take on this all these years later. And he said, we didn't realize, we were counting the missiles and the tanks. John Paul had the extra part of that equation that we'd forgotten, God, and he introduced it. Tell me your thoughts on the way in which he went about doing that and the importance of this trusting providence. And we see this again and again throughout his ministry in life. Pope uh, John Paul II, now saint, uh, is, he understood it's not politics, it's not the economy that runs the world, it's culture, mm -hmm. and culture is based on faith. Mm -hmm. And the faith of the people in Poland mm -hmm. was the basic uh, category of their entire life, of their national identity, mm -hmm. and it was their ma main defense against communism. Uh, when he spoke in Poland, it opened up the eyes not only of the Polish people, but the entire oppressed communist world. There's something better here. Mm -hmm. We experienced that in Cuba in 1998. That's I, right. you, were, you were there, mm -hmm. Bob Royal and I were there. It was fantastic. I was sitting in uh, Revolution Square, 
celebrating mass and the people are chanting the Pope wants us to be free. Mm -hmm. Now Castro allegedly was the liberator. He's the oppressor. He's the killer. He's the one who put people to death in the name of mm -hmm. liberty. Mm -hmm. The Pope comes and says I speak the truth of Christ and the message really hit home. Mm -hmm. It was wonderful. I love this idea, well Lessa raised it the other day, that one person could make a difference. This emphasis on the dignity of every person and it's not cooperatives, it's not the collective, it's the individual free and in tune with God who really changes the it's world. It's an essentially theological idea, isn't it? I mean, mm -hmm. all the other uh, uh, ideologies are predicated upon a different assumption, but the Christian view is that every person is created in God's image and likeness and then redeemed by Christ and destined for eternal life. And so that's the deepest ground for that keen sense of the uh, dignity of the individual. And if you try to abstract it from its theological base, I think uh, you open the door to trouble. I want to go to a little bite. This is a bit of our friend, Father Richard John Newhouse. Now this is from 2005, the last conclave that elected Pope Benedict. Listen to his analysis of John Paul II's appreciation of the world. He believed right from the beginning that culture is uh, stronger than politics, mm -hmm. stronger than the, the military factor, stronger than the economic factor. And by culture, uh, what does one mean? One means the ideas by which people live, by which they understand themselves and the world of which they're part. And particularly those ideas that are most foundational to their deepest convictions, which are usually religious in character. For example, very beautifully under Nazism when he was a young man. And there are those who would, uh, are critical of John Paul and say, you know, why didn't he take up a gun and join the resistance and go into the mountains? John Paul uh, studied theology, he wrote poems, he uh, acted in theater illegally right. uh, at the risk of his life and the life of others. And some people would say, well, you know, what effect is that? That's an ineffectual, idealistic, kind of dreamy approach. Mm -hmm. And John Paul then intuited and later would explain the intuition with great uh, persuasiveness that no, the cultural positing of the possibility of human dignity and freedom is power. It is power. Mm. It effects change. You know, as I listen to that, one of my cherished memories is in April of 1999, John Paul had come out with this letter to artists. Yeah. And uh, I happened to be at the Mass. He knew that I was an actor in my former life, and he gave me this letter. He made, Jeevich went and brought it to me in English translation. And I treasure that. He really had this emphasis that culture and art are so crucial to evangelization. The church needs art. To speak to that. Yeah, absolutely. I think beginning with beauty is often the most winsome way to do it. Especially in our postmodern environment, you begin with the truth, all the hackles go up. Who do you tell me what's true? Even worse, you begin with the good, don't yeah. tell me what to do. Yeah. But begin with the beautiful. Look behind us, just look at that. Go to the Sistine Chapel, just look at that. Go to Calcutta and just look at the sisters there. Mm. Uh, listen to a Mozart mass, just listen to that. It's a, it's a winsome way to get oriented toward the transcendent. Now that will lead you to the good and the true. Yeah. But I think beginning with the beautiful is often a very important strategy. And I think John Paul II, Benedict the 16th, and now Pope Francis too, beginning with mercy, beginning with joy, it's a very effective evangelical strategy. Mm -hmm. And this, this mercy, being on divine mercy, th this was at the center of John the 23rd's ministry, certainly Pope uh, John Paul II, and here again we see Francis bringing them both forward and raising up this notion of divine mercy on Divine Mercy Sunday. And that's a wonderful day to have this canonization precisely because it's the mercy of God that Pope John Paul II sought to bring to Poland and to all the other countries he visited. And that mercy is based precisely on the love of Christ manifested to the world. Robert, talk about this. You are the proprietor of an important internet destination. John Paul was so such a pioneer in so many ways, like my dear mother Angelica, who, whose ministry in, in so many ways mirrors John Paul. She started EWTN, began the movement toward it in 1978, the year he was elected pope. And, uh, and they sort of grew together and uh, you know had this amazing relationship. Tell me about the ground he broke for endeavors like yours. Well, you know, we've all been listening to clips of JP2 in these days, and when that voice, that, that Polish voice, whatever language he's speaking, yeah. it's got that actor's authority, and he knows how to pace things, and he conveys something. But I, I always think when I hear that, as beautiful as it is, it's a 
like a, uh, he's, he's the, the master communicator because he has something to communicate right. as well. And we have to say, even though the earlier popes existed in the television age, this was the first television papacy. Yeah. That, yes, he visited 129 different countries, but this was a man that, as we now, we, we've gotten a bit too used to, was available electronically just about any, any time of the day or night. So he knew that. It was a providential moment that, that the, the man who had that kind of presence uh, was the pope over almost 30 years of, of almost shaping the television presence of future papacy. Mm -hmm. I want to give each of you in our final moments a chance to weigh in on this. What are you most looking forward to tomorrow? What should the audience be looking for tomorrow at this major event, this canonization? You know, I think a display of, of the church's beauty, that's part of it. The liturgy is going to be very striking and stunning tomorrow. Just the setting for it, uh, the music, the vesture of all those involved. I think just that is very compelling. Uh, and then to see the crowd, I remember the beatification a few years ago, just to watch the crowd react to this, this electric moment when it's uh, announced. I think that's an evangelical moment. Father Jerry? You know, someone said that the best argument for Christianity are the saints, and uh -huh. I think that's precisely what we're going to experience. We don't honor a guy because he was a celebrity or people went to him for advice. We honor him because he was holy and he was a man who called us to holiness. And holiness is not abstract. Holiness is what he did. This pope loved to say the rosary, loved to be a bishop, loved to be the pope. He loved Christ. Yeah. Robert, I, I'm always struck at these large events at the Vatican that, yes, they're, they're public uh, expressions of enthusiasm, but there's also a certain recollection at various moments mm -hmm. that you, you, yeah, you have this, this, uh, this spectacle, but at the same time, there's, there's some depth here that, say, you wouldn't have at a presidential inauguration right. or a state funeral. There, there's something remarkable that only the church is able to bring to the world. Yeah, no, well, and, and to see these two great popes raised up and Pope Francis and Pope Benedict together this is going to be a striking moment, and you don't want to miss a second of it. Thank you all for being here, helping us put it in context. Our friend Father Barron will be leaving us, but the rest of the crew will be hanging tough, and we'll see you in the days ahead. Thank you all, gentlemen. That concludes this special Live from the Vatican. Be sure to join us for the canonization mass for Saints John Paul and John the 23rd, Sunday, April 27th, live at 3.30 a.m. Eastern. You can also catch a primetime encore at 7 p.m. Eastern on Sunday evening and again at 11 p.m. Eastern on Monday, April 28th. For our international viewers, check EWTN.com for re-air times in your region. Until then, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Like me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter at Raymond Arroyo. I've got all kinds of interesting things posted there. We will continue tomorrow on behalf of the canonization crew and the staff and crew of EWTN News. Thanks for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo. We'll see you next time. Bye now.